Hello and welcome everybody, I'm Proper Varian and this is the last video of the Canada AAR. Very excited to reach the end here, I cut out a bit, you know, certainly I cut the three last sections, which is an intermission where he just reported back, and then two other gameplay parts, I cut them down to just the relevant stuff that I would like to discuss with you, but it is still a story basically that you can follow if you are willing to do it. Now let's just jump into it and see what Daniel Tolman played together here. I continued my Canada game for a while outside of the AAR format, in case people are interested, here's a summary of how things progressed, I faced two main obstacles. First was that the industrialists I had spent most of the game building up are now my greatest opponents. Remember, we got rid of the landowners by virtue of building so many mines, which then had the industrialists of course in charge of the mines, making insane amount of money because those are the capitalists. And now the industrialists are saying, I actually hate you, I just remembered this. Now that I want to start passing social democratic reforms, they oppose rather than support my laws. This becomes a problem when the labor movement kicked off and threatened a general strike. If I didn't reform my poor laws into wage controls within a given period of time. So this is a really interesting statement. Does this mean that we are talking about the labor movement? So uh, actually, no, this is a movement. This is not an IG. So these are not the trade unions. I was thinking maybe it's just the negative trait of a trade union, you know, so of an IG. But no, this is a movement that apparently says, okay, we are the laborers and we want more rights or we're going to strike, which probably I assume would give negative modifiers for any building that has labor movement pops. At least that's what it sounds like to me, but who knows, honestly. But this is quite interesting. So he was forced to change the law to just accept the strike and maybe go in with violence. There is a very, very active uh, anti-labor movement sort of history within the United States of America, not necessarily in Canada at, Canada, at least not that I know, but in the United States of America, the labor movement was bombarded, literally bombed uh, when they started forming. And we, of course, have a very alive, a very lively labor movement in Europe and all over Europe as well. So this is quite realistic, although he is much more likely and much more willing to give in to this movement. Historically speaking, people wouldn't be doing this. So yeah, this is quite interesting and uh, a mechanic that I would like to see explained. Attempting to do this caused the industrialists to threaten revolution I wouldn't have been able to avoid. I just barely had time to pass guaranteed liberties, which lessens the risk of revolt if you invest in it sufficiently, and appease the industrialists and then pass wage controls before the strike broke out. Now I have a powerful and angry industrial uh, industrialist faction. Second obstacle was economic. I really wanted to get my hydroelectric power plants up and running and to use start using electricity in some of my industries to increase their output. I especially wanted to use it in my chemical plants to increase the output of explosives, which were nearing on a market shortage. Ontario actually has a state bonus to electricity generation due to the Ni Niagara Falls, and I was able to build quite a lot of power plants. Unfortunately, my output was affected greatly by the labor strike, and my membership in the British market came back to bite me. Mostly, I've been producing raw and manufactured goods that British pops and buildings want to buy, but which I have little use for within Canada. Electricity, at least in the current implementation, is just another market good, so all that I produced was available to the whole market immediately. This meant that I couldn't use it without creating a shortage as Britain was using it all to refrigerate fish. So Britain saw the AI basically perceives, hey, we have this in our market now, we can use it, let's use it. Um, Obviously, for electricity, this is complete nonsense, right? <laughs> if you could generate electricity somewhere and then use it just entirely without a loss somewhere else, then we would be doing it today, but we can't really do that, which is why these amazing plans, right, just uh, make all of the Australian desert or all of the Sahara into uh, solar plants. None of that is realistic. None of that makes any sense. We don't have the technology, even today, much less so back in the day. So uh, they were discussing a solution for this, how you could do electricity instead. What I really liked, and I think what he liked as well, was the topic of electricity as infrastructure. They basically talked about this, and the idea would be that similar to how you build up certain, you know, situations, so for example, example, the uh, just uh, trains or anything related to infrastructure in general, you know, in a state, you can also build up the electricity infrastructure. I think that isn't bad, especially for this time frame. That sort of very, very localized uh, energy market makes sense to me at the very least. Alternatively, you could at least just say, I don't know, make it infrastructure, but make it uh, continent wide, you know, so that you can't have Britain taken from Canada, but I think the infrastructure idea would serve it quite well. Anyway, that's the state of electricity right now. Britain is using it to refrigerate fish, meaning that he can't actually be using it for his goals and he needs to produce even more. Yeah, I do admit that the way electricity currently works is quite odd. Oh, I also researched feminism. I got an event where I could appease the industrialists by having the trade union leader resign. The new leader was a feminist who will support women's suffrage. That'll probably be my next law. Only irrelevant interest groups will even oppose it. It's possible for a more uh, for a more populist feminist movement to happen, but unlikely pass suffrage well before the triggers for that become valid. So it seems like 
certain ideas that will spawn over time when you get a certain level of tech, right? They will be something that is very popular and that they will be moving forward uh, with. Most of the time when we heard about movements, it was always to restore something or to preserve something. Those were the biggest movements mentioned, but it seems quite prevalent that the population actually says, you know what, I want workers' rights, I want feminism, so I want uh, uh, women's rights to work, to own property, to vote, and so on and so forth. And that is quite neat. Uh, in a regular playthrough where you don't become social democratic Democratic Space Canada, in a regular playthrough, you would likely be opposed to most of those because you want to keep the old power structures in play. But let's move on. What is the problem? Uh, what is the problem with electricity as good? Let's just go over that one more time. It's just a little odd that my hydroelectric plants in Ontario are being used to power fisheries in Ireland. Yeah, that's just not how it works. Regardless of the oddities with electricity specifically, the situation does highlight one of the downsides of being part of a large market. Everyone has access to all the goods, so you can't just produce something and expect to have control over what happens to it. So this is, in my opinion, one of those things where it's a very adequate abstraction. Is that actually the case? No. Uh, there can be internal restrictions of some sort or another, you know. Uh, for example, uh, certain goods, you know, uh, when I go to Czechia, for example, and I would want to buy a certain amount of cigarettes. If I wanted to do that, don't do that, kids. But if you wanted to do that, you would have limits on what you can do, meaning that the market isn't fully free, despite, you know, the European market, the Schengen realm, uh, room, uh, the Schengen area in particular, of course, being very, very free, both when it comes to goods, but also people transfer. But what I'm saying is there are more nuances to this that aren't necessarily reflected within the market system of Victoria 3. But I think this one is acceptable outside of electricity. When you have a market, when you are in a market, Victoria 3 has to assume that everything is available. Maybe we can, you know, uh, take make some brackets around the electricity, do that differently, and then you take a look at that because, hey, the game needs something to calculate it with, and that is basically the approach they have taken, where you just have an open market internally. Getting a head start on a brand new industry has a lot of benefits. Of course, it does. My power plants are also just not very efficient. Although you can build them with a tier 3 tech, they only really start outputting a lot of electricity with a tier 4 tech that adds coal as the primary input. Luckily, you have a local coal market with supply, right? Indeed. I'm the largest coal producer in the world now. I've maxed out every coal mine possible in Canada, using the most productive PMs I have available, which also helps with the price of explosives, making my chemical plants more profitable, and those are currently tech of the future, at least I would argue from this point of view. I think my current research is dynamite, which will make my minds even more productive, though I won't actually need to use that for a while. I produce, to ma uh, I produce so much coal that it's not especially expensive anymore. Coal mines are still profitable and a huge contributor to my GDP, but they don't instantly enrich everyone who works there anymore. Remember, they have such a huge standard of living, all because of coal. At this point, would rolling back on coal PMs be a good idea so that you produce less, getting an artificial shortage, making it so that it's worth more and you can make more money off of it. Well, I don't think so. Rolling back to all the PMs would make my chemical plants less profitable and again, those are the current money makers. But it's an interesting thought and I love that you can have this thought in Victoria 3. In Victoria t uh, 2, you could have this thought, but in a very roundabout way of actually closing down certain factories, that sort of stuff, right? Uh, I like that it's now an inherent game design principle right here. I'm a little worried about what will happen to my economy once oil starts being used. I'm very reliant on coal. I'm suppressing internal revolts by making my society so free and democratic that pops prefer to use the established political process to voice concerns rather than taking to the streets. This is a very unique playthrough and it basically can be described in this one sentence. In a normal playthrough, in a normal monarchist Canada playthrough, you wouldn't have purely industrialist and trade unions uh, circumstances. You would have circumstances where you want to keep the landowners, where you want to keep the petite bourgeoisie in power, right? So then you might have open revolts. Um, in this one, since you are highly democratic, since everybody has rights, yeah, everybody uses the democratic system. There is something that could be argued, and I mean, they try to, right? But there is something to be argued about maybe the petite bourgeoisie needing to be, and it will come up later as well, a bit more sticky in their power base, making it so that they could rise up in an attempt to reinstitute the proper monarchist circumstances. Uh, he gets lucky here, none of that happens, but yeah, right now a very different playthrough from I, what I think is at least would be a normal playthrough. Those fools think they can win elections and pass the reforms they like. Uh, this is, of course, spoken as a player, basically, because he knows that they won't be able to do it. Maybe you could artificially increase the demand for coal by making uh, more products with it. I actually don't make steel in Canada at all, so that is one of the products that could be used here. I've never really investigated the viability of the industry in my market. It does seem to undermine the uncertain possibilities of elections thing when the player can functionally prevent any law from passing except those that try outside the law means. Right, so unless somebody rebels and you lose the rebellion, there's a good point here by law some, I feel like, um, unless they lose that rebellion, they will be in a situation where the player always knows what will pass, what will be done. 
But it is also, honestly, I'll just, uh, the way I will describe it, and this is not about balancing or anything, but if you are in a circumstance at any given moment in Victoria 3 where everybody is rich and happy and educated, you will get a very progressive society in the sense that they are fine because they're not losing anything. They don't have any values that go against it. Things have changed significantly there, right? If you achieve such a circumstance, which is utopian in the world of the 19th century, then what is happening in the game here makes absolutely sense in my opinion. It's more that I know damn well that they're not going to win. Yeah, that's exactly what it is. The Mackenzie Union Coalition is really strong, while the uh, Petit Bourgeoisie and Industrialists will not team up together to oppose me, at least for now, so they are not running as a party. Whatever that means, gameplay-wise, we don't actually know. Can't you restrict the export of goods outside of your country? Yeah, my membership in the British market prevents me from having that control. Um, We didn't know for sure about this. It was always something that has been hypothesized, and I think this absolutely confirms it, that the market leader is only ever the only one that can set tariffs, that can make trade deals to a market. I believe this is just a fact. Um, it makes it so that it's very clear. You have a lot of very, you have it very easy to read information about a market as long as you know who the market leader is. So this does make sense. But man, yeah, it's definitely a big negative, a huge negative to even if you're freely, voluntarily in a customs union, right? To be in a customs union because you you lose all of that. Uh, let's say, for example, I don't know, Bavaria joins, and I mean they are in 1836. They are in the Zollverein. Um, I wonder whether there is a way to gain the customs union leadership. But that's a different question, I suppose, because uh, until then, I mean, yeah, you need Bavaria, you know, or rather you need the market as Bavaria to do something to really benefit from things. You don't even have a port at the end of the day. But what has to be said is if you can't take the customs union over, then you will always, always be in this position where you basically are losing out on an entire part of the game. Um, now, in this timeline, would Karl Marx be Canadian? No, we're not the first to discover socialism. Very interesting. I wonder who did it and who Karl Marx was in this timeline. The more progressive we get, the less authority we generate. I can barely even pass a single decree. Now, that is something that is really nice to see in the sense that it has been talked about in the dev diary and here we see it in action. People who fail to catch up with the progress are suppressed, I assume. Well, nobody is suppressed, actually. People are free to advocate for whatever ideas they like. It's just that with so many people able to vote, hopefully including women soon, very few people are listening to dumb ideas like feudalism or racism. It makes a lot of sense. If you have a very multicultural realm, obviously, unless one has the majority, which they don't because they are so many people, racism, you know, uh, segregation and so on are basically impossible because it was always hit people that, you know, otherwise can just live in a free society. So this will never happen. Feudalism, on the other hand, is in the interest of a bunch of very influential people, but they aren't that influential because of the voting rights. So, uh, yeah, no, this is exactly how that should work as well. I'm really happy to see just the, uh, the basically the confirmation of these mechanics panning out in this general design direction. That is what I was hoping for there, that it just confirms that they have their own interests it, at their heart, right? or uh, taking that very seriously. And because of that, you have certain things that are possible and impossible based on the power structure. Lovely to see. Uh, more suffrage basically empowers the lower strata. Laborers typically don't care about politics, but with the franchise extended and literacy increasing, they're joining the unions and droves. Uh, literacy has a major role when it comes to uh, whether they are politically inactive or not. The unions have also been empowered by the fact that I covered, uh, I caved into all of their demands during strike negotiations. They are very powerful and very successful, very popular. Makes a lot of sense. If they are successful, then yeah, people love it. If you suppress them, you may have just destroyed the labor movement for centuries to come. Please don't go Stalinistic though. Definitely not doing Stalinism in this run. Maybe council communism. Who knows? Given that the trade unions seem to be largely powered by immigrant pops, what's it looking like for the PB and migration controls? Only the petite bourgeoisie cares about migration control. They're definitely very relevant IG, but it's one of the reasons they don't get along with the industrialists who really like the influx of cheap labor. And this is very interesting. So there is a lateral relationship here. We talked about this in the last dev diary, uh, in the last AR as well. We talked about it during the dev diaries, but these lateral relationships between IGs and how that might impact the ideology of these IGs is very, very interesting to, uh, interesting to me. That is definitely something that I want to see further explained. I am Fingers crossed that maybe in February we will see, you know, the topic of uh, of parties. I would love to see that explained. Maybe the topic as well of IGs changing ideologies, traits and so on. That would be gorgeous. My God, there's so much potential in there to actually have a crystallization, to have a visualization of the current streams, you know, where your population is going and why they're going there. If the PB, for example, kept migration control, but then said for everybody who is here, you get huge benefits, you get, you know, I don't know, better rights, that sort of stuff. Maybe people would pivot to the PB instead of, you know, the 
uh, trade unions, whether they can react to political circumstances that flexibly, I don't know. I will be honest with you, I doubt it. But if they could, wouldn't that be great? I would love to see some elaboration at Dev Diary on that for sure. I will say that it's incredibly difficult to transition to communism peacefully. Council republics are opposed by most IGs. Is it actually possible for you to break free of Britain by paying reparations? Britain doesn't care to manipulate my internal politics. I can go communist and they won't do anything but grumble. Uh, mm, that's no, <laughs> no, <laughs> especially not in this time period. No, listen, um, I think this should be true if Ge if Great Britain has a certain faction in power that wants to say we want to ignore what happens in our colonies, but they didn't ignore it. When you look at uh, South Africa, and I mean, okay, at that point it was already like released, but they still had this huge influence on the Commonwealth. When we look at uh, Rhodesia, right, and the suppression that. Uh, uh, Great Britain put in there because of course Great Britain starting here in the Victorian age was anti-slavery was anti-segregation that is exactly why they intervened there they intervened and we're not talking about some communists taking it over no we are talking about individual ideological points that were vital that were important to the British government and to the British public so going communist which uh, is basically an entire table of contents that the British government the British public would not like and that not having an answer from Great Britain, it's, yeah, it's not that. L listen, if the EIC, for example, right, if they go and say we are now a British Rajdom, like we are legitimately ruled by the Maharaja of all of India, and we're no longer ruled by the British ruling class, Britain wouldn't just say, well, as long as you are my puppet. No, they straight up would have destroyed the new EIC government. Not that the EIC would have ever been able to maintain that, but what I'm saying is that this ignorance that these overlords have to have here. It's it's certainly getting very... Uh, I, I dislike this. I dislike this a lot, no doubt. <laughs> um, by the way, can you leave the British market of your own volition? No, I would need to gain independence and Britain will not let that happen without a fight. That makes a lot of sense to me. I just wish it, uh, wish it was a bit more interconnected with the actual, you know, Canadian internal politics as well. If this happened to another major power, like for a uh, crazy example, Russia, would the other major powers intervene? We're talking about communism here. They would. That's good to see. I like that. At the very least, we can see it on an international stage, although, you know, the overlord and underling relationship is rather underdeveloped. Does this apply if there's a civil war or only if you switch to communism peacefully? If there was a civil war, I would expect Britain to step in and support the anti-communist side. So do it peacefully and Britain will say nothing. Have a civil war and Britain will come in. Well, uh, maybe at some point we will get an expansion of that. I certainly would hope so. If I somehow do it peacefully, they have no right to intervene. Uh, they kind of do. <laughs> Can you do that? Or is it hard? Very hard. Nearly everyone will oppose it. I need to engineer a situation where only the trade unions are powerful. For the moment, I can't even pass the law to begin with. The labor movement wants labor rights rather than the abolition of capitalism at the moment. That makes sense. It's a much more pertinent issue. We know that socialism is... Uh, we know what socialism is, but the unions have yet to adopt it. Again, we see something here about the interest groups adopting... As certain traits. I personally, the way it seems is basically that if you unlock something, there is a chance maybe every month or so of one of your IGs uh, that fits the most. So trade unions for socialism. Uh, if you have liberal democracy, you know, like values, basically republicanism that goes maybe towards the petite bourgeoisie later on. But I would hope that it might be a bit more dynamic. You know, I would like to see something where if you are agrarian, if you are very, for example, Christian, I mean, Catholicism literally has an answer to socialism, right? Uh, distributism. And uh, if, if you follow that sort of thing, you might be able, or you should be able, in my opinion, have an IG adopt socialist policies under a non-socialist uh, guise, which, of course, you know, is just a question about who owns the means of production, how they are distributed, although they are farther, further reaching things. But let's not get political. <laughs> no, what I mean is, let's not go too deep into it because it really doesn't matter. But what I mean to bring up is, I hope that when it comes to the adoption of newly unlocked policies, that the interest groups really have a bit of a dynamic impact on this, right? Where they are standing, whether they are marginalized, whether they are powerful, and so on and so forth. If you're powerful and you are a conservative, you are primarily there to preserve a situation of power that you're currently holding. If you are marginalized, you might be more open to new approaches because you, it's currently not working for you, right? Your power base is gone. We will see that a bit later as well. Uh, let's take a look at this. Right. Oh, that reminds me. The poor laws were giving the industrialists 30% more political power due to my high investment in it. That is pretty insane. Replacing it with wage controls has entirely removed that extra power. Yeah, this is insane. 
The law also means that there is a national minimum wage. If UK gets into a war and calls its subjects into the war, do you get anything out of it? You get nothing. So you just need to decide whether you care about the war goals. That also means you can shirk the call, right? Join the war but do nothing. Colonies can drop out of wars called by the overlords for a relationship, uh, relationship penalty. I wish there was more to it, but honestly, I've I've uh, beaten this dead horse enough. I definitely, my, my primary wish for post-release, because this isn't going to be in pre-release, let's not, you know, uh, think about that even, I don't think that's very realistic, but my primary wish personally for post-release most certainly are international organizations, be that vassal top-down relationships, such as, for example, the Commonwealth, the French Empire, the German Empire, and so on, the Japanese Empire, the Qing Empire, you know, the Great Qing, uh, be that those relationships or be that international uh, equalized uh, situations like the German Confederation, like the League of Nations, that sort of stuff, I would really, really like it if they got a bit of a, an overhaul because, yeah, it's workable, what is in right now, right? But doesn't make me happy. No, it certainly does not. Uh, there's no relationship between you actually, you know, shirking them. You could just do it randomly. You could do it because you want to become free of them. You just get a flat relations penalty no matter what. I would rather drop out during the diplopay than technically join the war but do nothing. Huh, why? I don't want anyone deciding that they can win the war by cutting off Britain's supply of coal. We talked about it yesterday, that if you cut them off, if you cut Canada off, they all literally only have access to the goods within their state, meaning that Quebec can't trade with Toronto and they might starve. So yeah, you definitely want to avoid that if you are a market member of an overseas market capital. Uh, does Britain want to annex you for your resources? No, it already has my resources. They take all my electricity for their fish refrigeration. I would also like it, and this, again, more mechanics, right? If we were looking in a situation where, for example, Britain actively wants to pursue this and not just randomly decide it. Uh, but yeah, I mean, it, that would also depend on the internal politics of Britain. We talked about this in the past, that the Little Englanders w most certainly would not have wanted a Canada to join uh, Great Britain directly. But maybe a different faction would have, right? That could have been interesting. Anyway, they take all their electricity. Even though I want to use it to make dynamite. Any major land changes? Is Africa getting colonized? I'm not really paying much attention to the world outside of the British market. In contrast to the Pope run, things are generally very stable. Uh, Canada will be in the British market until it's no longer advantageous, right? I'm just not at all set up to lead my own market. For one thing, we produce essentially no food. Is it realistic that before refrigeration I can buy fish from Great Britain in Canada? The answer is very much no. But the reality is that unless you impl uh, implement different market thresholds where, for example, certain goods that are perishable must be traded on the same continent or on the same strategic region, whereas others that are non-perishable do not have to be traded this way and can be traded on the entire market unless you implement that. And at that point, you really, really overthrow what the market system right now is in Victoria 3. Um, unless you implement that, you have to expect this, you have to live with it, I guess. You know, that's the way I would phrase it. Ultimately, it's an abstraction that is necessary, so perfectly fine that, you know, hey, he's not producing any food whatsoever, or, well, almost no food, right? He can just buy it from Britain because it's one market. You need some sort of, uh, uh, you know, uh, abstraction somewhere, and this is basically an uh, acceptable term in my uh, mind, at least. Canada currently has only four non-marginal IGs, and I'd like to reduce that in, uh, rather than increase the number. Let's take a look at them. There's the intelligentsia and unions on the government side, and the industrialists and PB, so the petite bourgeoisie, in the opposition. Devout, utterly marginalized since the separation of church and state, is this correct? Yes, there are no laws at all giving the power, and their usual agricultural power base doesn't exist because we do not farm. Do the US have tried to expand to the Pacific? I think you need taxes to start manifesting destiny. They don't have taxes. Not that that stops them from just starting place to see stuff, but AI is much more likely to want California after they develop ideas about their natural borders. Feels like there should be, and this is a very interesting point that we're definitely going to uh, pick up here, there should be a bit more stickiness to the power and influence of IGs. It's not entirely determined by economic materialist factors, and it seems odd that a religion could go from established to marginalized so quickly. Pops aren't going to rapidly abandon their beliefs, even if they are changed by circumstance over time. People are still religious, but the political power of the organized state religion has entirely collapsed. Plus, we have many faiths in Canada now. Huge numbers of people are Catholic, Jewish, or Orthodox. So... This is a really interesting point. Um, I fundamentally agree with ADS21 right here. Is that a, a Formula One meme? Anyway, uh, I fundamentally agree with that. I don't think that it's entirely unrealistic, but it's somewhat unrealistic. What I mean is, if you want some examples of it taking a while, especially in pre-totalitarian states, to reduce the power of someone, 
I invite you to look at Bismarck and his church, uh, you know, the, the church fight, the church, uh, what, what's it called in English? Kulturkampf, right? I invite you to look at that because he very aggressively tried to fight against Catholicism and its political influence and it didn't really work. I even invite you to look at Italy. Italy had a really tough time with the Pope because, well, they ended the Pope's existence after the Pope had uh, held, for, you know, uh, land in some form or another and, uh, since, uh, what, like the 8th century, right? And I will tell you that it's not that successful. If you look at other countries that were totalitarian, well, not totalitarian, that's the wrong word, that were very clear dictatorships, the Kaiserreich wasn't per se a dictatorship, um, but when you look at, for example, Poland uh, under communism, right, or under socialism, well, listen, don't worry, okay? <laughs> what I mean is very much still religious. The power didn't really move away, and you could argue, and you und undoubtedly should argue, that Poland in, 19, in the 1980s and then towards 1990 had the power of the Communist Party eroded because of the church. Similar to how East Germany had a lot of the power base that was in the opposition come from the Protestant church, right? These are interesting things because what they show is that there is a certain degree of stickiness. Doubtlessly, there is a certain degree of stickiness that still leaves you with influence. You can't just get rid of this. I think uh, maybe marginalization should be something that happens less quickly, but there's also a different angle here where it's completely viable, in my opinion, to say... The marginaliz uh, marginalization does not mean that they don't have people that would like to go towards this faction, but it could mean that they currently do not see the opportunity or the option to really support them. What do I mean? Yes, as much as the Protestant churches in Poland, or the in Poland was the Catholic Church, but the Protestant Church in, uh, in East Germany, as much as they supported the opposition forces and ultimately had clout in this system, right, take control and make it so that the dictatorships fell. Um, we are looking at a situation where, for the longest time, nobody dared directly say, "I, you know, openly support this. Screw this system. Screw it. Get it. Get it out of here." Right? None of that stuff for the longest time during the existence of these governments uh, was something that was viable. And if that isn't marginalization, then what would be? Right? So the way I kind of see it is that maybe more stickiness is something that you want to have. But marginalization does not mean that they don't have an extreme power potential, I think. It just means that currently they are not going to be able to muster that potential, to bring it forth and really throw a wrench into the opponent, right? Um, I think that both of those are correct statements, right? We might want more stickiness, but we also have to accept that even if you have potential, you can't always actually unfold that. And what I am thinking about, and this brings us back to the interest groups potentially needing or, you know, it would be nice if they were very dynamic in how their traits could be based on whether they are in power or whether they are marginalized. I do feel as though there should be a chance that a devout faction, right, that may be very agrarian oriented, that may be oriented towards certain things, uh, towards discrimination and whatnot, is able, if they are marginalized, to more quickly and more likely maybe, to abandon and to adopt a certain range of policies. Let's talk, for example, again, let's talk about distributism. I, I, I believe distributism or distributionism. Don't worry about it, okay? I'm mostly talking about this sort of stuff in German. Uh, so the, the English vocabulary is not really present for me. But what I'm saying is they could be adopting that if they are not in power. If they are in power, then they would be very interested to keep their already existing voter base and power base in control, which are the landowners, right? Or, well, people that are primarily from rural circumstances. But if circumstances change, the IGs should also adopt uh, or adapt. And it should adapt depending on their circumstances. I would really like that. So I'm arguing both in favor for stickiness. I'm arguing not in favor of stickiness, more of a rebound, you know, a, a bounce back. And I'm arguing very much in favor of maybe ideology of marginalized IGs changing much more frequently. Maybe that's already in. I don't know. But this is a super interesting debate. People don't stop being faithful just because their, you know, power or rather their faith currently does not have any influence in politics. They do not stop being faithful. But... The clout, obviously, is pretty gone. Um, anyway, people are still religious, right. Uh, shouldn't the church still have influence over the people? Again, they lack their traditional power base and there are no laws arbitrarily po uh, popping them up. Nobody wants the Anglican church to be politically relevant, so they are not pe perfectly fine, in my opinion. But maybe when the laws, such as the religious school laws, right, when they were, when they were removed, maybe there should have been a stronger reaction from the church. But we don't know how the clouts 
how close revolutions etc actually were as he was playing it because this is just in writing. So they have no money and no one is helping them, they have no money, unlike say the industrialists who have a huge amount of wealth. But coal miners aren't arbitrarily less religious than farmers, that is entirely correct. Uh, the church is really not speaking to their material or social interests though. If the standard of living uh, of pops decreases compared to previous years, does it lead to any particular turmoil or agitation? Yes. A lot of the Yukon gold was depleted, which created a lot of radicals in the middle of nowhere. I really like this. The, the question of the uh, suppressed IGs and whatnot. I think stickiness, rebouncing, uh, re uh, rebounding, and changing the uh, ideology of, uh, of an IG to a certain degree, I think those should both maybe play a bigger role. That could be quite interesting. Right, I spend a lot of the game orienting my economy around the heavy industry, around Great Britain, of course. Seeing how you said that quick and large economic booms can both ble be a blessing and a curse, because you'll eventually go down and suffer from turmoil. Does this mean it should incentivize players to grow their economies gradually, not all at once? Well, that's the safe and cowardly way, sure. I prefer to ride the boom and use the money to invest in other industries so things don't fall apart when the boom ends. Okay, Keynes. Uh, as a smaller nation, risks are often worth taking because the alternative is staying small and irrelevant. One thing we haven't seen much of in this AAR is rural economies. That was the plan for Russia, but the game crashed. Might try again. Uh, might try that again sometime. I would really like to see basically a permanent dictatorship, in the, or uh, a permanent monarchy, where you never liberalize that sort of stuff, and then see how many rebellions you get. I guess one downside of my ARs is that you are only getting my playstyle and my commentary on things that I personally find interesting. That's a fact. We talked about it actually, uh, I, I talked about it with my friends that I basically was saying, I like the ARs, I'm a big fan, there's a lot that is revealed and that can be talked about, but we see for example no events, no event lines, storylines, right? No journals, nothing like that, no decisions taken, no uh, actual changes, and that certainly gives us just a very one-sided impression. This one for example is primarily just about I'm changing laws and I'm doing economy. Still hugely interesting, but there's so much more going on that we're not learning about. Uh, obviously, these only give a certain part of the picture. I think it's Canada time again. This is the, I believe, the last image here. Not sure. Confederated Canada continues here. I still need public health care, but I guess things have evolved a bit. New goal is uh, social democratic utopia. So, I've run into a bit of a blocker in terms of reforms. I have this really powerful capitalist class who really, really do not enjoy things like workers' rights and welfare. Their power bases are the industries that support our economy. Coal, wood, motors, chemicals. These industries are the very same that the trade unions draw their own ranks from, so I can't just transition my economy to other industries to disempower the capitalists. I need to figure out a way to continue passing reforms without the industrialists overthrowing the government. This is a contraption of his own design. He made these people this rich, and I love that. If what I do today is ideal, tomorrow it could, could be suboptimal, because all of a sudden I have a huge, very powerful opponent. Big fan of this dynamic. One thing I can do is invest further in internal security through my guaranteed liberties law. This will make revolutions much less likely to succeed, but that just gives me a buffer. I'll still hit a wall eventually. Will stronger income taxation help curb their power? I expect it would. Relieving the tax burden from the lower strata and adding it to the upper strata will definitely even out the balance of power. Our current income tax, uh, tax law is payroll tax, which primary, uh, primarily puts the tax burden on the lower and middle strata. I could actually move to proportional income tax without radicalizing the industrialists. Changing the face of your political stage via Texas. Tutorial 3 is gonna be... That, that's gonna be fun. Trust me, you can't really do that anywhere else because everything else would just be optimal or suboptimal. But here it's like, yeah, let me just tweak this here to make them angry, but also to, you know, disenfranchise them a bit. I think I let the industrialists cool off from all these other laws passed for a while while I expand my institutions. Then I'll try for propor a proportional income tax. And while that's all going on, I think it's time for women's suffrage. This is the first time that one of my reforms has actually been opposed by Mackenzie's intelligentsia. Liberals like progress, but not too much progress. Of course they don't, because they now are in the power-defending situation. We have to really make that clear. At the start, the petite bourgeoisie, the landowners, they are in that power. They are in that situation. And maybe, you know, uh, for example, the intelligentsia wants to go further with that. But once the intelligentsia is in power, I mean, that's their ideal. Right? Once the trade unions are in power, they will reject getting rid of their own power. Who wouldn't? I mean, that is the one of the most core principles, I think, of governance. And it always will try to protect itself. I think it may be time to form a government that does not include the intelligentsia. 
Now it's time for a new governor. Gordon Maitland is leader of the trade unions and he has a strong feminist belief. He firmly believes in, he, uh, in the need for universal wom uh, women's suffrage. Very nice. Since we're passing a law that the intelligentsia don't like it, we've also kicked them out of the government. We are no longer getting their bonuses. But by 100% migration attraction, that is a big loss. That's odd. The landowners have clawed their way back to relevance. Only barely, but enough to ally with the PB to oppose women's suffrage. They're not going to be able to stop it though. Very interesting that they are allying there. Again, we saw it earlier that the PB and the industrialists were unwilling to combine their power, but the landowners and the PB very much willing to do that. They seem to be both reactionary socially and anti-capitalist. Is this correct? They are definitely not anti-capitalist. Also, interesting world news. The EIC has been reformed into the Raj, so maybe there was the uh, rebellion that is of course something that occurred in India at the time. Is it still its own tag or is it directly owned? It's a separate country, so EIC basically just developed. Maybe this gives them more prestige, maybe this is like a higher stage, right, a formable, who knows. Oh, I see where the landowners are drawing power from. There's no jobs in the more remote areas, but they still receive some migrants. This has made subsistence farms return and those employ aristocrats which support the landowners. We can address this by developing more of the country. Interesting. Uh, which country gave Canada the most uh, migrants? UK. English and Irish are the largest non-Canadian -Can uh, minorities. Oh dear, Governor Maitland was assassinated. This is bad because his feminist ideology was the only thing making women's uh, suffrage law possible. By whom? The PB are most likely responsible. See, this is what I mean. We never, we will never learn what this actually means, what actually happened, what actually occurred here. But I'm so interested what the implications, what the reasons and what the results of this assassination by the PBR. There is so much that could be done with this, so much. And we will never learn about it until, you know, we actually learn about it in DDs on actual gameplay, that sort of stuff, because in this AAR, not elaborated upon. The new government is Jacques Lory. He's a radical, which isn't terribly helpful to us because we've already had a radical government and passed most of the reforms. Again, still not sure about that nomenclature there. We actually have only one law that gives power to the landowners, peasant levies. If we got rid of that, we could possibly marginalize the landowners again. Um, is the suffragette law being dropped? Unfortunately, yes, it has no support anymore because the faction that did support it while he was in power, the leader that actually had that as their ideology, is no longer supporting it. They're not interested in the law, meaning they won't help pass it. That is how that happens. Uh, the leader of an IG will have their own trait and their trait influences what the IG likes and dislikes in terms of laws. And this one, they're no longer interested. Yeah, they don't really care. I'm going to pass a law that the PB actually approve of, Professional Army. For the first time in a very long time, xenophobia is not activated. They aren't that unhappy anymore. Things are looking good. Haven't had such a high standard of living since I was one state minor Ontario. Look at this. My god. Impoverished are 14.5, so that's the lower strata. Middle strata is prosperous and the upper strata is affluent. Literally a paradise in the 19th century. How likely is that, huh? Earthquake devastated Washington, but nobody lived there, so nobody cares. How are the IGs looking now? Very powerful trade unions and industrialists. Powerful intelligentsia and PB, very weak landowners. Everyone else is marginalized. All Canadian residents are guaranteed welfare that puts them above the poverty line, and all workers are guaranteed a living wage. The price of wood has dropped to dangerously low levels. I'm not entirely sure what the cause of this market crash is. Consumption seems to have dropped. Hold up. It's not just wood that's the problem. Nearly all of my industries have started failing. What's happening here? All right, I'm fairly sure, uh, sure I see the problem. The minimum wage is so high that no business is profitable. That's pretty, honestly, that's pretty funny. The, 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 the predictive nature, you know, the predictive uh, stats appear to not have helped them here. That's, that's, that's kind of funny. This would potentially be resolvable if I didn't employ capitalists in my industries, but we are a long way away from seizing the means of production. So basically, since the capitalists take money out of it, right? Instead of distributing that money properly and, if necessary, uh, reducing the income of everybody that is a different ownership model, right? But as long as they are capitalists, they will insist on their payment. At least that's how I'm reading this. And since they insist on their payment at the minimum wage is that high, all of a sudden, you're in the minus, right? That, that's basically the idea here. I think I need to reduce minimum wage for now. Was the capitalists take most of the money the industry makes? Yes, exactly. How did any of that lead to a market... Uh, uh, Failage and market fail. I misidentified the problem. It's definitely true that prices of some of my goods are a bit on the low side, but that was the case months ago, so that won't be the uh, the ultimate case. This is all very unfortunate. My standard of living was over 18. I guess that'll drop when I reduce minimum wage. Liter literacy is up to 70% now, but that might drop. Schools are still private, and I expect that people were only becoming literate because they could afford private schools due to the high minimum wage. Really ought to get public schools. Yeah, makes a lot of sense. But otherwise, the other option was to crash his entire economy. On the plus side, the trade unions really come out on top in the recent elections. Mackenzie is dead. 
The very foolish people decided it would be cool to smash two trains together and Mackenzie board front row seats. Another assassination, yet again, very interesting. This turned out badly for him. In honor of Mackenzie's radical struggle for progress and equality, we are researching anarchism. The standard of living reduction from reducing minimum wage is going to create a lot of radicals. This isn't good. I think we'll end it here for today. I'm going to take advantage of a drop in COVID booster clinic. Remember to get your booster, folks. Uh, it's time for the thrilling conclusion of Confederated Canada. Let's finish this. Through extensive economic micro, I was able to mitigate the problem through the use of technology. So we were in a very bad situation of standard of livid, uh, living losing and he mitigated it. Let's take a look at it. Inventions such as the steam donkey allowed me to activate production methods that automated my industry to a greater degree, generating more outputs. This requires more material inputs like coals and tools, but the reduction in less qualified laborers meant a huge reduction in wage expenses. This did slightly empower the industrialists and disempower the trade unions because, you know, they got kicked out, they changed uh, pop profession and so on, but not as much as you'd think. Although we employed less lower strata pops overall, we employed more machinists who are more likely to be politically engaged and those machinists make excellent wages due to, the, uh, due to their profitable places of employment. Shortly after dealing with the economic problem, the feminist movement kicked off for real. The previous attempt at enacting, uh, enacting women's suffrage rested on the political will of one man. This time, it was supported by the voice of a nation. Despite fairly significant resistance, eventually even the petite bourgeoisie was swayed to the cause. Canada now has universal suffrage for all citizens. Cool. I like that. It basically came in as a movement, it failed initially, and then the people said, you know what, let's just push it. I, I really like this. This concept is a really neat gameplay feedback loop where you do actually have to implement laws that you don't want to implement because there are strong movements for them. Something truly revolutionary happened in Ontario. A man dug a hole in the ground and struck oil. Oil turned out to have a broad set of applications, some of which remain undiscovered. For now, we are primarily using it in our newly deployed furniture manufactories using the mech and mechanized workshop PM. We are able to churn out mountains of furniture every day. Oil has become more valuable than gold. And this is huge because, uh, of course, the oil workers get a lot of money. The people in the furniture manufactories are getting a lot of money. But more importantly, this makes furniture very cheap, and cheap furniture, higher standard of living. That's how easy it is. And since furniture manufacturers can be built anywhere, I decided that the more remote parts of the country should share in the wealth. Even Nunavut has a healthy furniture industry at this point. <laughs> Honestly, the, the one-sided cash crop sort of mentality that he has here, maybe that should be nerfed. <laughs> <laughs> if you could have, and we, we talked about this last video, and it's an interesting thought experiment. If you could have sub-market areas that share certain goods, and going from sub-market area 1 to sub-market area B gets maybe higher costs, maybe a throughput issue, that sort of stuff, um, you could have a situation where you need to not just be cash crop oriented. I think that would help normalize standard of living questions as well right here. You are insane. You're a utopia, basically, right? But you could get rid of that with that sort of solution. I, I honestly, sub-market capital, so for example, London is the market capital and it's also the market capital of the sub-region of the British Isles. Then Canada has its own market capital. Br uh, India has maybe like two or three market capitals. It's a hugely populous area, of course, at the end of the day. Africa has one, two, three, four, five, whatever market capitals. All of those market capitals, uh, capitals try to connect to Britain, right, to London, except yeah, they try to connect to it. If they can't connect, then they still trade within themselves with whatever they can connect to, or maybe just within their subregion. Also acceptable, in my opinion. But maybe some goods can only be trade, uh, traded within one subregion. I kind of would like that, honestly. I, I kind of would like that. Let me, let me know what you think. I, I don't know whether it's viable. They, I think they said they tried this, and it isn't, but... It's so weird that, like, everybody in Canada is making furniture, and they're the richest people in the world. That's kind of crazy, right? <laughs> <laughs> this sort of cash crop mentality should at least be mitigated a bit, uh, in my opinion. Right, I just researched combustion engines. After switching PMs in the oil rig, it's now the number one most productive building in the world, generating £55,000 per week in profit. That's insane. The trade unions got a new leader, and thus the country got a new governor. William Thompson is a social democrat. He believes in the achievement of socialism through reformist and electoral means. So, um... That's an explanation if you're European, if you're American, then uh, that's a joke on your on your cost, uh, the Americans. But if you're American, then you won't really understand that. But basically, um, when we hear social democracy, do not think about it in the terms of a modern European party, because the modern European parties that are social democratic abandoned reformism, meaning the actual reform in to socialism and communism. They abandoned that in the 70s and 80s, at least the... Uh, 
the British Labour Party, the, the German SPD, and I believe uh, most, if not all, of the other social democratic parties as well. The PD, for example, in Italy did that as well, if I'm not mistaken here. And they are now just looking at a social democratized capitalism model, right? Back in the day, when, for example, in, in, in Germany, you had uh, La Salle, you know, leading the SPD, you had uh, people very engaged there. They very much were in favor of reformism. No revolution, no rebellion, but reform towards socialism was the core idea of social democracy and that's exactly what this is it's not the modern approximation of this no it's the old understanding of the term social democrat his first act was to begin enacting old age pensions which passed on its first run through the legal system though this did slightly reduce the workforce ratio this wasn't really a problem because we were already there were already more people than available jobs the benefit of this law was that the income and political participation of dependents increased drastically and these newly enfranchised people supported the unions making the unions even stronger. With most IGs appeased by the recent passing of women's suffrage and the massive influx of new supporters for Thompson's socialist reforms, there was a brief window of opportunity to do the unthinkable. We enacted council republics through peaceful legal means. There was also a bug where the industrialists failed to oppose the law, probably wouldn't have been able to do this otherwise. This is important. This is cool. We're seeing something you wouldn't have otherwise seen. And this is around the year, I think 1880 is where he finishes. Without this bug, he wouldn't have been able to do it. And I think that's good, right? Um, he could have had a revolution, he could have tried to fight a war, but I think this, as it stands, is good. In 1880, you should have a very strong faction, maybe, that demands for this, but being able to just do it, to just push it through and then still be a vassal of the queen, very weird, but it is what it is, right? What I'm saying is, though, that this time frame seems good to me. 1880 is just when, in Germany, for example, the very intense fights against social democracy from Bismarck's governments, uh, you know, was in its height, basically, when it really proceeded into it and when he began passing reforms as well to make it so that nobody would vote for the Social Democrats, which didn't stop them. The Social Democrats would become the strongest faction at the time in the Kaiserreich. It's a very interesting history to begin with. Uh, we had the same concerns, we had the same topics emerge in Britain, in France, and so on. So this is a good time frame, if you ask me. Uh, Chairman William Thompson, leader of the People's Dominion of Canada, decreed a total reorganization of the nation's political system. Every workplace beca uh, became a workers' cooperative. Private ownership of industry was entirely abolished. Without the capitalist class taking the lion's share of profits for their own selfish use, business boomed. Nearly every industry saw an increase in profitability, and these profits were distributed among the workers. The nation remains highly democratic and free. The electoral system has changed somewhat. Workers now elect delegates to local councils, and those local councils elect representatives to regional councils, who elect delegates in the central government. It's a very bottom-up system. The total abolition of the private ownership essentially abolished the capitalist class. There are, however, a few stragglers. I am playing the world's smallest violin. So these are Franco-Canadian Protestant, very interesting, Franco-Canadian Protestant Saskatchewan-based capitalists that are now unemployed and are struggling. So they are very likely to migrate away or change their pop profession. Child labor was abolished and the education system expanded. Oddly enough, Canada never moved towards public systems of healthcare or education. Because my pops are so wealthy, private systems are actually more effective than public systems. I ra rationalize this as doctors and teachers having their own worker corps rather than being an arm of the government. Fair enough, I guess. It's just a, a semantics. What's the average standard of living? Look at this. This is the flag of Canada. The average standard of living is 25.7. Um, make sure that you look at this uh, zoomed-in version of the flag. It appears to be generated. Due to various mass migration movements and gradual assimilation, Anglo-Canadians now make up about half of the total population, which is more than it's been since we had the gigantic influx of migrants. That influx ended due to a, a various factors, including the intelligentsia now no longer supporting government policies. And now here come the big numbers. Out of 14 million citizens, 8 million are loyalists. The council system has the overwhelming support of the people. Literacy is over 90%. The balance of power has shifted drastically. Where once Anglo-Canadians held disproportionate political power, each culture now has pretty much exactly equal power of their population share. Things are not so equal when it comes to professions. Machinists are around three times more powerful than their population share. Due to political disengagement, laborers are still only at about two-thirds of the population share. Peasants are totally disengaged and have no power. We've been working on abolition of subsistence farming anyway. Engineers are also very powerful. Some engineers support the industrialist IG, keeping that group relevant. So we have trade unions and industrialists, I guess. So that's it. Canada has become a socialist utopia and economic powerhouse through a triumph of democracy and very specific cash crop based circumstances. If interest groups can change policy, does that mean you can get the bonus of immigration from intelligentsia while not dismantling everything or becoming a council republic? 
Potentially, but not sure how I'll get the Intelligenza to like me that much again. When I had that bonus, they were in government and I was constantly passing policies they liked. I am very interested in what it could look like for the Intelligenza to change their policies. How, what is the process? How is it calculated? Can I influence it? So many things I want to know about. Something I find quite interesting is how hugely my internal politics were affected by never developing agricultural industry. There are almost no farms in Canada at all. This would have made my life more difficult as well as created a pretty different final state of internal politics. Farms employ aristocrats, farmers and clergymen who would have made the devout landowners and rural folk significant players. While in my playthrough they were irrelevant for most of the game. This is what I was talking about. You could normalize this extreme effect of all of these disappearing, not being sticky enough if you will, if you had sub-market cap uh, sub capitals, which make it so that certain goods have to be produced and bought there, meaning that he needs a certain minimum of food and, and whatever other production you have, you know? That is the sort of thing that I think would actually help a lot. Yeah, no, my, my biggest takeaway from this AR, doubtlessly, is that if they are viable to be implemented, sub-market capitals, maybe per strategic region, would be a good idea in my opinion. The Council of Republic law also specifically empowers machinists and farmers. A more agrarian communist Canada would have to contend with a very powerful rural folk IG. Is this actually in the AI logic? They take the opposing side of revolution against McGovern, so this is uh, if he were to have a revolution instead of just the reform. Overlords won't start place to force their subjects to change their government. Yeah, come on. Uh, which year is it? 1880. It's a, it's a good year to at least have a strong labor movement. What he did, he obviously was over the top, but there was a bug involved, very special gameplay, etc. You get it. Compared to previous playthroughs you've done, how fun was this one? This one was very fun and a lot more varied than I was expecting. The early One Province minor boom was fantastic. I enjoyed adapting to having to integrate more and more Canadian states. Mackenzie was super cool, especially his death, and the bumpy road to socialism was interesting. Ah, it certainly sounds like it. Oh yeah, was the Canada communist flag auto-generated? Almost certainly. If we ever design a communist flag, I'd want a maple leaf. I like that. Are there no disadvantages to worker corps in Victoria 3? That depends on your goals. If you want a capitalist society, then worker corps are the mechanisms of Satan because they would get rid of the pop power that you need to be powerful. But financially, worker corps are just better, at least in the current build. That's balancing. Uh, we need a British GDP per capita to see who is richer, a Canadian or a British. British GDP per capita is 3.39. Ours is 17.20. We're winning, and they're winning so much they're gonna get tired of winning. That's insane. These are insane numbers, quite quite frankly. <laughs> it can't really just be described otherwise. I, I would like it if... Uh, yeah, no, if, if there was some sort of mechanic to make you have less profitable uh, uh, production sites, such as, for example, you know, of course, food. You know, basic stuff. Uh, Daniel did say worker corps are financially better, right? This should provide more context, and there is also a bug here. Uh, you will be able to see that you need baking powder for being a publicly traded pl power plant, and you don't make power out of baking powder. But basically, this one, you can see right here, if you substitute this, right? Uh, minus 8.41k. If you go to publicly traded from worker corp. Worker corp just makes you a lot more money. Uh, no, self-evidently, you shouldn't be doing that, right? It has to be rebalanced. Can be rebalanced. I'm sure it's just some number tweaking. I'm curious though, what's the difference between publicly traded and privately owned? Currently, public companies just employ even more capitalists, making the business drastically less profitable to, uh, to no advantage other than maybe making the industrialists more powerful. They should be changed before release. Good to know, good to know. Um, it's somewhat saddening, of course, that, and, and I mean, this has been known for a while now, but I do want to bring it up. It's somewhat saddening to me that publicly traded companies, you know, there is no like national stock market or anything of that sort. To work in that building as one of the owners, you still need to live in the same state, right? And with the conglomerates formed, especially in the later period of this uh, time frame, be it in Canada, in Great Britain, or be it in Germany, I mean, just look at uh, ThyssenKrupp, right? Look at uh, everything related to our industrial sector, really, it was all a, a giant conglomerate. None of that can really be symbolized outside of these pops that own it locally being in the national interest uh, industrial industrialist group making it so that they sort of are getting together as though it was a conglomerate but basically i would personally say that this side of the industry plus the question of international relationships and how you interact with your vassals how you interact on a german confederacy level those are the two things that i really desperately wants i want and this aar has reinforced that feeling for me and that's it for today, and that's it for this AAR. I will see you later, alligator.